coming up on the Canna Cribs podcast. The, the ability to develop those global brands the, the, is, is going to be different by category and it's going to be determined a lot by the ability to move product cross border. Whereas we will invest in both public companies that are listed as well as private companies on this podcast so far that I think is a real kind of determinant of success for investment in cannabis going forward is what's going to happen to the illicit market. Hey, I'm Nick, creator of Canna Cribs and Growers Network, where we have educated millions of people on how to elevate their craft. I have toured some of the largest grow operations, befriended the best growers, and built a network of the top cannabis companies. Join me on this next adventure where I document history with the pioneers shaping the global cannabis industry in real time. Welcome to the Cannacribs Podcast. The Cannacribs Podcast is brought to you by the top brands in the game. We have six categories we want to highlight to help you elevate your craft. Starting off with Cultivation by Grodan, Lighting by Horticulture Lighting Group, Nutrients by Athena, Climate Control by Quest, Post Harvest by Green Bros, and Dispensary by Trees. Thank you to these partners for helping us create this podcast and helping us bring more knowledge to the world. If you want to support the Canacris podcast, head on over to the link in the description or go to growershouse.com and check out these industry leaders today. Hey, thanks for watching the episode today. Did you know that we have a consulting division? We actually help design and build some of the most productive commercial facilities that you see right here on YouTube. If you need help building, retrofitting, or optimizing your commercial grow, hit that link in the description below and fill out the form. Now back to the episode. And then when I was a lawyer, I uh, started doing a lot of work for commercial clients, hedge funds, investment firms, and I thought, wow, that's a pretty interesting job. I don't really think about the money part. I just always wanted to do something that was kind of interesting and fun. Um, and as a student, I thought, well, investing is pretty cool because you have to study new industries, learn how they operate, uh, think through not just how they make money, but Comp competition. So you're always learning, you're always researching, you're always thinking about something new. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and I thought that was a lot more fun than what I was doing because I felt like what I was doing as a lawyer became pretty repetitive. At, at right. Um, and so I got an offer to jump over from being a lawyer to one of my clients as, as an investor. And this was in 2007. Uh, and I jumped on it. And, uh, and then built a really successful investment career. Uh, what was that initial investment opportunity? Uh, yeah, so the, the, you know, the, the, the um, firm was a, what, what they call a multi-strategy hedge fund. So they, they managed about $15 million at the time. They did everything from private equity to healthcare to industrials. I mean, they invested in almost anything, right? Um, and my initial role was to focus on credit and uh, bankrupt companies because there was a big legal element to that. Okay. But over time, I gravitated to investing in almost anything. Uh, and then that job took me to London where I ended up running the European uh, office for that company. And, and then I came back to the United States uh, in 2018 and was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Right. Uh, I thought maybe I would start my own firm. I thought maybe I would go work at another big company. I just didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something else that was interesting and I was passionate about. And when I thought about the last, when I thought about my investing career, I realized that usually the best opportunities are thematic where you find kind of one area that can be a really big opportunity for many years and you kind of ride that theme and often those themes are out of favor so for example 
2011, 2012, buying housing in the United States, especially in some of the areas where um, there was a subprime crisis, was pretty out of favor uh, with multiple years of house price declines and a view that Arizona, Nevada, California, Florida had just been overbuilt relative to the ultimate demand. Uh, but those, that was a great opportunity. And you just have to take a multi-year view that those places would eventually come back. And so I've always, you know, in my investment career, found kind of big themes and thought they were an interesting opportunity. And so I was looking for a big theme. And in 2019, somebody said to me, well, have you thought about cannabis? This could be a really interesting theme. Uh, 2018, 2019, and I kind of dismissed it. And I said, well, you know, it's federally illegal. And Just didn't a, seem feasible. Yeah, and I'm not a use. you know, it's not like I'm a heavy user. Or seems fine. I'm not against it, but I wasn't. And then somebody said, well, you know what? This is an $80 and $100 billion industry. It's completely legal. No institutional capital will touch it. Um, it could be a great five to 10 year theme if it ever gets federally legalized. And it just seems pretty obvious that it will get federally legalized, just a question of when. Mm-hmm. And um, and so the more I looked into it, the more I thought, well, I, I should start investing in this area. So I started investing personally. Uh, and I looked around, I met a lot of the entrepreneurs who were building businesses. And I talked to some the the very early stage firms that were uh, getting involved in investing. And I, and I found a few of them and I gave, and, and I interviewed all of them and I gave some money to two guys who I knew um, were pretty thoughtful, were the founders of Navy Capital. And the more I got to know them and the more I kept finding interesting things to do with them, the more we realized that it, there was some nice synergy there. Right. And so they said, well, how would you think about coming on board and joining us and being a partner with us and, and helping us build this company to focus on cannabis investing? And at first I was pretty dismissive. And then the more I thought about it, uh, the more I thought, you know, this is what I want to do. This is, this is a great five to 10 year opportunity. And at a point in my career where I can, I can leverage everything I've learned to this really interesting industry. And I, and I, and I, and, and I'm, passionate about it. I believe in the industry. I believe in the social cause of the industry. I believe in legalization. Um, and uh, and so I jumped in with two feet. I have never looked back. That's incredible. Well, you're on the right side of history. And yeah. uh, for everyone listening, we're going to dive into Navy Capital and your different investments, what you look for, um, and you know how growers and licensed operators can find capital with your advice in this interview. And just starting at the very, very top, um, Navy Capital is a hedge fund. Um, there are also private equity groups, venture capitalists, angel investors. Um, are there any cursory explanations you can give us today of what yeah. makes each one different? So let me let me explain kind of how broadly the investment universe works, and then we can talk about what Navy Capital is. Okay. Cool. So the, the broad investment universe in that what I would call the mature putting aside cannabis, just the mature universe right. is for growing companies. You start with an angel investor. So a small company, the people who put the first money in, those are called angel investors. Those are usually a few hundred thousand dollars, million dollars. Somebody has an idea, they 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 put together a presentation, they said I have this idea, will you help me start this company? That's an angel investor. You then work your way up to what they call a seed investor. And 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 in some like if you went to technology, for example, there's different comp- people who focus on different things. There's people that, that we just do we, we we only do angel. We only do seed. We only do you know because they, they become very specialized uh, in in most areas. Okay, uh, cannabis is a little bit different. It's not that big of a universe. But let's just start with what these categories broad investors are, broad categories. So you start with angel, then you've got seed where you're, where you've got your idea, you got it off the ground. You're ready to kind of get that first check in to really propel your business from idea stage to implementation. That's your seed. You then go to what's called the series A. Your business is now maturing. You're looking for a bigger check. Maybe it's in the 
five, 10, $15 million range. Those are your series A investors. And then between them and when you go public or sell your company, there's infinite wrap. You know, you could have series B, D, D, E, F. Some people, they have, they have a profitable business from day one and they never have any further capital put into the business. That, that just depends on the business. At the end of that, you become a public company if you or you sell yourself to another company, right? Uh, some type of you, exit activity. Some type of exit. Now, you the business and make cash, but most of these companies, when you're getting outside investors, angel investors, et cetera, seed investors, they're looking for an exit. They're looking to get a return on their capital as opposed to making a yearly dividend, okay? Uh, sometimes families are okay setting up a business and just taking the cash out every year, but usually when you're taking money from an outside investor, that outside investor has some expectation of getting their money back and, and making a return on that capital. Uh, and hedge funds and private equity, so venture capital firms, operate anywhere from that kind of seed to series A, B, kind of C, early stage, B, early stage. Pre Once you become a public company, the venture capital firms are not playing anymore. Then it's your uh, hedge funds who are investing in public companies okay? uh, or mutual funds. Those are the difference in a hedge fund and a mutual fund. A hedge fund uh, can do a broader array of things. A mutual fund focuses just on buying stocks. Okay. That's it. And a private equity fund is typically investing in a more mature business, either that's already been listed and taking it private uh, or a larger private company that they're just eventually, they themselves will sell on to the public market or to another private equity firm. Okay. Um, this, the private equity business grew out of uh, what, what was called the LBO business, which, bio, which basically said, if you buy a business for $10, if you get the bank and the bond market to give you 7 or $8, you can put $2 of equity. You bought it for 10 If it becomes worth 14 your two becomes six, you triple your money, right? So you essentially use leverage to amplify your returns. And that's more private and, equity. That's more private equity, okay? Today, you have private equity firms that use leverage, some that use less leverage, some that do leverage buyouts, some that don't. It's a it's a big mishmash in here. Mm -hmm. um, Navy Capital is called a hedge fund because we're willing to buy public companies, okay? But we also do everything from seed investments to venture investments to private equity. We, we, we'll run the whole gamut. So. We like to think of ourselves as an investment firm, but because the universe, you know, because investors are so used to these categories, they always say, well, what, what are you? Are you a private equity firm? Are you a, uh, are you a venture capital firm? Are you a hedge fund? And so the most generic broad category that we think we fall into is hedge funds. We call ourselves a hedge fund. Okay. Uh, but what distinguishes us, for example, from some of the other firms in cannabis that are strictly private equity firms or strictly venture capital firms, and what makes us different from them is that those firms will exclusively buy companies that are not yet public. Right. Whereas we will invest in both public companies that are listed as well as private companies. Okay. And to kind of shine a light on some of those examples, um, could you talk about one of your private investments versus one of your public investments? How, they're, how are they similar? How are they different? Yeah. So uh, the, just kind of teach the audience. Yeah. The public investments tend to be more mature. So, for example, one of our private investments is a beverage company called Can. Oh, I love which, Can. Yeah. yeah. So we were uh, the first investors in Cam. Jake and Luke just had an idea, right? They had just come out of Bain Capital. Uh, oh, wow. I did not know that. And they were, one went to Harvard Business School, the other went to Stanford Business School, and they had an idea. They said, we want to we do a beverage. 
and here's how we're thinking about it. And we thought that's a cool idea. And it was really doing cannabis beverages and we gave them their first money, their seed capital. Oh, wow. And super so early stage. Super early stage. It's just a, it was just an idea. Like a proof of concept. Proof of concept. We should do okay. a beverage. Yeah. And, and then they've, then they raised a series A, series B, they've raised subsequent rounds and we've continue to invest with them each step along the way. And then more recently, we have actually reduced our uh, investments as the company has matured okay. and has become more valuable and a much bigger company. Um, and so we've sort of adjusted the size of the company within our portfolio. That would be a very early stage investment where two people have a great idea and they bring us that idea. We say, this is something nobody else is doing. We'll give you your capital to get your idea to formulation stage. How do we go and get uh, start to implement this idea? Okay. okay. On the other hand, we're investors in TrueLeaf, mm -hmm. a very large public company, the dominant player in Florida, vertically integrated. They do everything from seeds to sale, right? They are... Uh, to, to retail. The true vertical, yeah. True vertical integration, right? They are growing, they're doing the production, they're doing the packaging, they are selling through their own stores, and they have 50% market share in Florida, which is their predominant market. It's phenomenal. Like, what yeah. other company in what other state can say that? I mean, that's None. insane. I mean, they got a, they had some advantages, right? Florida basically said, uh, uh, that you have to be vertically integrated to operate in Florida, which was a very unique dynamic, but their CEO understood that advantage and conferred that very, very early. And they pushed that advantage more aggressively than any other company to a place where they now have probably a real uh, moat in the state where I live, where they have 50% of the, the, the market and the other 21 operators in the state share the other 50%, uh, and they're doing extremely well. So, uh, and it'll be very hard to displace because they have real economies of scale. Scale matters at a high, at a local level. Maybe not at a national level, but at a local level, scale really matters. And they have the scale to do things that their competitors can't do. They have, so they could always produce a, a superior product at a at a better price than their competitors can in the state. Um, and so those would be two, two of our bigger investments, but very different in, 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 in nature, right? One is, uh, an investment in, in two individuals who have an idea mm -hmm. and one is an investment in a company that's public, that's liquid, and that, um, has a multi-billion dollar valuation and, uh, just trades at what we think is a very big discount to its fair value. Yeah. And do you encourage any type of kind of interplay between portfolio companies like truly having the can license for Florida? Absolutely. Stuff like that? Yeah. We, I mean, for, you know, we're, we're investors in uh, connected cannabis mm -hmm. um, and they are going to this September start selling in the state of Florida exclusively through truly for the partnership okay. of truly. Uh, they're also in Arizona in a partnership with True, what was once Harvest and is now True Leaf. Ah, um, okay. I filmed that grow operation in Phoenix when it first yeah. came out. Yeah. So uh, we definitely encourage our portfolio companies to work with one another, but only when it's mutually advantageous, right? So we're not trying to... Uh, we're not trying to, you know, because we understand that each company has its own investors and has to do what's best for that company. Yeah. And so where there's mutual advantages, we definitely try to create an ecosystem where our portfolio companies can work together. I think one of the things that investors don't realize is how fragmented this industry is. We've done a lot of investor days where we bring our portfolio companies together. They could be two of the biggest operators in California. And they don't even know each other, right? So I think wow. it's... It's amazing. It's siloed. How it's so siloed, and people really have. Why? Why their, is that? I think. I think it's because it's. First of all, it's a. It's a competitive industry. Yeah. And so people 
uh, and, and it's very difficult because of all the regulation and because of the federal issues and because of the cash issues. I mean, there's a lot of obstacles. And so people have their head down focused on growing their business and they don't often don't have the time to look around. Um, and it's hard and, and, and it's often difficult to decipher who you who to spend time with. Right. And so our job is that's our job. Our job is we're not out there operating businesses. Right. Our job is to go through and meet everybody and figure out who do we want to curate relationships with and then put that makes the, sense. Put people together where the best where of the best. Sense, best of the best. Yeah. Okay. That makes complete sense. And um, we're going to get into connected and, and, you know, how to seek investment, all that good stuff. But I, I am curious. Um, for just kind of general investment trends that you've seen in the cannabis space today? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I've been involved in the industry for a few years, right? And I think that um, one of the things that happens in any kind of emerging industry like this is that you don't know what you don't know. And there's just a lot of unknowns. Uh, some of them are regulatory driven. Many of them are and many of them are driven by consumer tastes. But those are two big unknowns. Right. Okay? And so investment dollars have gravitated around because, because those are two such big unknowns. Investment dollars have tried to predict where those things are going to land. Okay. So for example, if you could if you knew you would have federal legalization and cross-border commerce, you would want to position with some of the best lowest cost growers and producers that could sell their product nationwide or some of the better brands that could do those. Conversely, if you knew that you weren't never gonna get into interstate commerce, you would focus on the people who might have the strongest business in some smaller states, but right. that are protected right from they have their own moats regionally sure right and so if you never have to work if you're a, a producer in utah but you never have to worry about california competition that might be a very good business but if all of a sudden california product come to utah that's maybe not a very good business jungle all, boys right? so, coming to florida exactly so all of a sudden you have to really think about and and that's and that's an unknown and so over time, investment dollars have gra grappled with that question. Like, okay, do I want to be in California where maybe I'm going to have some of the best operators, but it's a hyper competitive market? Or do I want to be in Utah where you, maybe it's not as competitive, but if I ever have to compete with California, I'm going to have a big problem, right? Yeah. So where are those investment dollars going? And I think that's shifted back, you know, that, that, that ebbs and flows and ebbs and flows. And then the second kind of big thing that investors have to, so that's the regulatory piece. Where is right. the regulatory? And land? do you lean towards a certain side, like more more regional state, or does it change with the year? Like where, yeah, where's so Navy Capital job, sit? We, we've tried to be diversified, right? To have some exposure to companies that we think will do extremely well. If you have a more lib what I would call a liberal regulatory regime and other companies that don't do well, if you have a more restricted regulatory regime and to try to balance the portfolio, create a portfolio effect, right? right? Uh, as opposed to a concentrated one side or the other. Yeah, diversify uh, your, mitigate your risk, I guess. Mitigate diversify your risk. It, yeah. Whereas obviously if you're a company or you're an individual who's trying to grow a business, you have to make a bet, right? You have to make a bet. Uh, the second, so I think that's one big unknown that makes in that has from and just talking about from the perspective of an investor, mm -hmm. okay, that in the investment world in cannabis has had to grapple with is what will the regulatory framework be? Not just today, but five years from now, ten years from now. Because if you want to grow a business that has long term value, you kind of want to think about not just today. But what does that business look like? You have years, to think about years, the future. Years. Yeah. Right. Second big unknown is what is, how does the customer respond to cannabis? Okay. So does the customer care about brand? 
does the customer respond to brands? Does the customer care about retail experience? Do brands matter in some categories, but not others? Ooh, that's fascinating. Right? And, and, and that is also a big unknown because we've had an 80 to $100 billion market in cannabis, but we've never had an illicit market, but that's been a How do we quantify market, that? Right? We don't I mean, know. I mean, that, there's yeah, just that's estimates, like right? estimate, yeah. Estimates. Uh, but they seem reasonable. Today, you have a $20 billion legal market, okay. but it's still really early, right? We're only a few years into this journey. So if you look at uh, wine, for example, uh, it's not as brand driven. There's a few California wineries where people know the name, but it's generally you walk into your wine store and you say, I love cab. What do you got for $20 that I would like? And and so it's a lot of it is price the, to terpenes the wine store. Exactly. Yeah. So, but if you, if you're, that's in a really the, good point. I've never thought about that. But if you go to the liquor store, usually go in and say, I, want, I like Casamigos. I like mm -hmm. Classe Azul. I like, you know, I like yeah. this whiskey. I like Don Jack Julio Daniels, Don, yeah. <laughs> Whatever it is, yeah. you got your brand. Mm -hmm. Beer drinkers tend to have the certain beers they like, or, yeah. but then when they're buying craft, they say, what's the best local beer? What you got that's local, that's good, that's a good lager. I want to check it out. So brands, mm -hmm. but then, you know, if you're, if you're in the market for almonds, you go to Whole Foods and you buy almonds. Yeah. Okay? But if you're in the market for almond no butter. No brand and, yeah. But if you're in the, if you're going in to buy almond butter, people tend to buy Justin's and not yeah. the Whole Foods almond butter. Why? You know, what, yeah. what is it that drives brands in certain categories, but not in others? Why is it that in many categories, whatever Whole Foods, you, you, you make, your, your shopping decision is, I'm going to go to Whole Foods and whatever they carry there, or I'm going to go to Sprouts, or I'm going to go to Publix, whatever they right. carry there is what I'm going to buy. Whereas in other categories, you say, well, I really like this yogurt, or I really like this almond butter. And so if they don't have it there, I'm going to go to wherever they have it, mm -hmm. right? And cannabis is super early in that, in that understanding. Yeah, we don't have Whole Foods. We don't have you know and these so retail is, staples yet right is can a brand or is somebody going to come up with the or or is, is are people just going to say i want to drink yeah and there's going to be thirty thousand of them it doesn't matter what, they what are, are your right? assumptions by like the top three categories you know flower carts yeah. and you know I drinks or beverages what's interesting is you look at california right as like a, a test market and what do you see in California is that, like, there are some categories that are very brand dominant. They tend to be edibles, ah, right? So yeah. anything you eat tends to be pretty brand heavy. Maybe because people are used to brands with whatever you, you're eating, right? Or, like, there's an associate. But for whatever reason, if you look in every state, the top two or three edibles players have dominant market share. Okay? Wana gummies, for example. Wana I was talking gummies. to Caleb about that. Yeah. Wana gummies. Kiva chocolates. Kiva. Like they're yeah. dominant, right? You go if you go to flower, it's very fragmented. Hmm. Right? Very fragmented. Where the brand doesn't seem to matter quite as much, other than maybe at the high end. Right. The generic in, in, that, in that middle market, like nobody's really been able to build a flower brand, not just in California, but like nowhere in the country is there like a middle market. Flat. There's no Budweiser. Right. Yet. Yet. But maybe never. Maybe. Really. Flower might be more like wine. Right. Okay. Where there is no dominant wine. Brand. Price to THC ratio or price to terpenes. I want to try something new every day. Yeah. Right. Like if you buy a Kiva chocolate, you want it to be the same every day. But if oh, you want, if you, but yeah. if you buy flour, maybe you want like to try different strains. You want to try different brands. You want to try different yeah. things. You're always looking for variety. Also, the effect. 
Like if yeah. I gave you a, a clear bag with an edible and a couple, you know, nugs, which one are you more likely to take? Like you want to know what's in that edible, right? Because yeah, yeah. that could send you to the moon. Um, right. So, I mean, that's how I see it at least. Yeah. yeah. And so you want more confidence with that edible. Right. So maybe the brand speaks to a reliability much more so than it does in flour. Yeah. Uh, so, but in flat, but that's not to say that there aren't high end winemakers that make lots of money that have real brands, but it's mostly at the high end, maybe yeah. not so much the low end, right? Um, retail, you know, does Men Men have, like, there's no liquor store brand. There's Total Wine. But that's just because people go there because they know they can get a lot of variety at a good price. Bevmo, Total Wine, like right. you know, retails right. like that. But is MedMen more retail centric? Like but that's man, yeah, MedMen is is re but MedMen's taking the Whole Foods bet. They're basically yeah. saying the customer is going to say, "I can get whatever I want at MedMen, and I'll let MedMen decide what the best stuff is." Mm. Right. So the two kind of big unknowns in cannabis are where will uh, the regulatory framework land? And number two, how will customer taste evolve around brands? Is it just going to be low cost production of an agricultural commodity? Or is it going to be a CPG game. Like, is this a consumer product like any other consumer product where there's big margin made by the people who can own the brand, right? right. The guy who grows the wheat and the hops doesn't make much money, but Budweiser sure does. Yeah. Right? The guy who grows the grapes that, he's, that sells to the, the high-end winery doesn't make much money, but the high-end winery sure does. But the the guy who grows the best almonds in the country and sells them to his boutique almond, you know, he makes good money. He's the farmer. So where where is the power going to land? Where is the margin going to end up being owned in cannabis is a big item. Okay. And I think we're starting to get some data points. We're starting to see a picture, but it's still a very hazy picture. Right. Okay. And, and 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 part of it is because the way you build brands is national. Most brands are national or super regional. Well, you can't do that in Canada. And a lot of the ways in which you build them, advertising, Facebook, Instagram, the the the, the, the a lot of the tools that you would use are restricted. Right? You can't use them people get their facebook pages taken down instagram pages are constantly being taken down so the tools that you would normally use to build a national brand are also pretty limited and regulated right? yeah. and regulated so yeah. it's very so i think if you think about investment in this industry those are the two big unknowns right. and if i look back at the last five years investors have kind of gravitated around mm -hmm. right for a long time people said i want to be in california brands because they're going to be the big winners and then everybody said well geez california is a hyper competitive market it's super brutal you might not get national legalization for a very long time and how are these brands ever going to get out of california they're we're stuck in this hyper competitive market that investment thesis kind of lost its, its overtax yeah it's yeah. a lot so of variables then, in cali then market. then the investment universe said geez maybe that's not the best i you know maybe that's not the best investment thesis let's go and buy invest our money in limited licenses because arizona if we have one if we have one of the five ten fifteen licenses in pennsylvania or in mass in new jersey we can make a lot of money Okay, Massachusetts, limited licenses. Then what happens? Over time, people realize, okay, but but then, the mar you know, if you make a lot of money up front, then the market gets competitive, prices start coming down, and all of a sudden, 
that ramp is not as long as you thought it was going to be. Additional licenses, you know. Additional licenses, yeah. people grow, people, investments get made. So that so then you you realize, okay, these markets are, you know, you, are competitive also. Uh, so I think investors have kind of chased different themes mm-hmm. at different times. And which right. one would you say is is the riskiest out of to invest um, cultivation, processing, retail? Um, what would you say is the riskiest? Yeah, and then I don't think it's 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 like whether it's cultivation, processing, or retail. I think that the riskiest investment, in my view, in cannabis is is the investments that have been made on the assumption. Mm that competition isn't going to happen. Right. Right. The Utah so, example you were saying, exactly. like the limited licenses com- in Jersey. Right. right. So like the, the people who said, well, I'm going to buy this New York license, you know, today New York licenses are trading. And then, and then to think that you can just make garbage products and, 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 and just have an It's never a runway. good business model. No. I, I think that's the riskiest business model because you're you're betting uh, against market forces essentially, right? You're yeah. you're basically making a bet on a regulator regulator protecting your advantage, and I think that's the riskiest bet in cannabis. The best bet is you've got a business that can survive and thrive in a competitive environment. Right. So you, you, you're the lowest cost produce, you, producer. You're, you, you, you have some of the best flour. You uh, make Kiva gummies. Like these are great, you know, uh, Wana Wild. These are great businesses because they've been exposed to competition and they've done great in a competitive market. And if you've been exposed to competition and not great in a competitive market, then I think you've got a much longer runway than those businesses. So to me, it's not so much whether you're in cultivation, you're in production, you're in brand. It's are you investing on something that's got a longer term moat or are you investing in something that's profitable today because the the regulator has made it profitable today? Right. And um, would you say, Chayton, that the grower that has the exclusive uh, state processing, you know, kind of license with Kiva um, is just as good as as of an investment as Kiva itself? Or do you rank those differently? Right. I I mean, I think the question is, uh, could Kiva uh, get the same... uh, product from somebody else like who has the leverage in that relationship right and my sense is that the customer uh identifies with kiva yeah and so they've got that 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 they've got a a longer term moat but it's this is a question in every industry right like who has more power the guy who makes seatbelts for ford or ford right well, if you're the best, you know, seatbelt manufacturer, or you're the best uh, auto parts manufacturer, you can have a very good business. Although it tends to be the case that if you're making the electronic chip, it's a lot harder to, for for them to to out to to replace you because you've got some real technological advantage than if you're making the seatbelt. Right. right, and I think it's the same thing in cannabis. Like if you're just growing for distillate, and there's nothing special about what you're doing, then you better be processor. the cheapest. Right, you better be the cheapest guy in town. Yeah, or gal in town. Right, and so yeah. like if you're making seatbelts, you better be the cheapest seatbelt maker in the world because otherwise they're just gonna re- they they will eventually replace you. Right, right? but if you're making a a very nuanced ship for the car. And you've got the technology for that. You've got real power over Ford, right? And so, if you have really unique genetics that are going into the end 
Kiva Gummy, and those are, you know, really unique and special, and you've really, and, and you own that technology, then yeah, you have real leverage. But my bet is that most of what they're using is distillate, and they're just going to go to the cheapest cost provider. Right. That makes sense. And, and distribution as well. They're vertically integrated. I actually right. filmed a, a grower in Michigan that had that deal. We filmed their Kiva line, their Wana line. Um, it's just kind of interesting to learn about uh, their business at that time. But um, I'm sure you tracked that Wana deal. They recently exited. Um, I don't have the exact figure off the top of my head, but uh, why yeah. do you think it was for so much? Was it that brand kind of loyalty and um because it was a pretty it was billions um for yeah. a gummy company um yeah i would um i would uh i would say two things one is that the canadian companies clearly have a problem they have uh, a market that's way overcapitalized relative to the size of that market Okay. It was capitalized with the view that it would be the global supplier, and that has not materialized. Okay. Um, so you do have too much capital looking to bail out their investment. Number two, uh, so that so I would say that in the context of cannabis, it looks to me like a pretty expensive valuation because they felt like they needed to do something and they had the capital for the whole in their pocket and they needed to do something. Okay. And they wanted to buy a category leader. And that was the price that they were, that the category leader was able to extract. Would okay. I have paid that? Not even close. Okay. Now, on the other hand, I will say so, so that if you look at emerging consumer brands in other categories outside of cannabis look at celsius the drink company right look at where uh justin's which is basically peanut butter almond butter etc uh, look at where some of these other brands trade they trade at huge multiples of revenues so if you basically said Within the can within cannabis, do I think it was a good deal? Does do, do I think that valuation was justified? I do not. Okay, but the benchmarks but I, were applied. But if I look at where do consumer brands trade outside of cannabis, then it doesn't look crazy at all, okay. right? And that's one of the, the 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 oddity that that's one of the on one hand the frustrating parts about cannabis, and on the other part the opportunity in cannabis, right? is that if you look at the valuations at which cannabis assets trade, they are materially lower than the valuations in any other CPG category. Now, cannabis has some wood to chop because it has to prove that it is a CPG category. Uh, and the only way you can prove that is when the regulation comes down and you have a real market and then these brands really emerge and become national brands. And so there's a little bit of a, a, a chicken and egg problem there. But if you were to believe that this is a real CPG business, then the valuations of the leading CPG companies are fractions of what they would be in any other category, whether it be alcohol, beverage, fruit roll-ups, snacks, whatever you want to, whatever CPG category you want to look at the valuations of emerging brands in those different categories are many, many multiples of what they are in cannabis. Let's talk about Horticulture Lighting Group. Made in the USA, Horticulture Lighting Group manufactures high efficiency LED grow lights for both commercial and home growers. Nestled in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, HLG has been pushing the boundaries of LED lighting since 2016. With a focus on quality, HLG has helped growers maximize yields, improve harvest quality, and lower overall operating costs. Through their high efficiency lamps, all deliver with stellar customer service. Horticultural Lighting Group provides real efficiency and real yields. Check them out at hlg.com. So um, there's a lot of people listening. They might uh, have won a license for a cultivation. 
uh, might be an investor, might be, uh, you know, uh, a group that's opening up in their new state. And they're wondering, um, how do they seek investment? You know, like, what are the the channels? Who do they go seek investment from? What's that process look like? So I figured we could start there. Yeah. Look, I think in in many industries, it's pretty uh it's pretty well well understood, right? Um, and in cannabis, it's very opaque. It's very opaque because there's very few investment groups, right? If you, if just to give you a sense, Navy Capital probably has about three hundred million dollars of capital, and we're one of the largest investors. That's in like space. assets under management. Yes, okay. and so. Uh, there are, uh, you know, if we were in any other industry, we would be like irrelevant. We'd be so small that like it wouldn't even matter. So that that just gives you a sense for how uh, limited institutional capital is hmm. in our space, right? The majority of people, and to be frank, the majority of people who have new businesses, whether it's new grow, new whatever, that are getting going uh, in cannabis are raising money from friends and family. Okay. That's the unfortunate reality, right? There is not a lot of institutional capital. Where people have been successful, when I tell people, if you're starting a company, you've got a great idea, go to the big conferences. The Benzinga, MJ Biz. MJ Biz, and just talk to everybody. Okay. Right? Talk to everybody there and and bring it. bring five or six pages that clearly lay out your idea and meet as many people as you can. That's the best way, right? Like your pitch That'd deck. Be, yeah, you bring your five, six page. Don't bring a thirty-page deck and don't bring a and don't bring nothing, right? Bring something that in More five than or six business pages company. tell tells you tells people what your idea is, what you're looking to raise money for, and why it's going to be a big opportunity for them. And then just network the heck out of those conferences. That's that's the best way to go about it. I wish there was a better way. Okay. I do. But I, if, if you really look at like most of the businesses in cannabis that are getting going, almost all of them have got going by raising some money from friends and family. Yeah. Yeah. Not everyone has a couple million laying around to start a right. company. No. And the and the and the brutal reality is is that there is just isn't a deep institutional bench. Yeah. So for example, you're starting a tech company in America. Go to in Sand Hill. Any city, you go to your angel group, yeah. right? Sand Hill investors in in California, or there's like a million other uh, angel groups you can go to, right? Uh, there's pitch competitions, etc. You're starting a, a, a CPG company. There's there's places to go. You, there's a there's a ritual, there's there's a process, etc. That being said, let's not sugarcoat it. Even if, if you're trying to start a business in almost any other category, friends and family is still the way to go. Because at the end of the day, if you've never done it before, if you've got something brand new, most of the time, people the people unless it's something really truly revolutionary, where an angel investor is going to say. I've never heard this idea. This is just amazing, blah, blah, blah. The, the reality is that most businesses, when they're first starting, succeed or fail based on the entrepreneur. And the, the jockey, best person to, not the to, horse. Exactly. The best person to bet on the entrepreneur at a very early stage is the people who know that person. Yeah. Right? Truly know their friends yeah. and their family. That makes complete sense. And, um, when you go to these conferences, is there a Navy Capital booth or is it just, you know, you know them through this person over there? Just kind of like you know, networking. Mo most of it is networking. Okay. Okay. And most of the early stage investments we've made, whether it, it is, is because we call, is because Kayla, uh, Caleb or Jake and Luke or somebody calls us and says, there's this guy we know or we met, or this gal, she's got this great brand. She's got this great idea. He's got this, you know, neat, you know, delivery platform. That's really interesting. Uh, they're doing something they, they just want to license in, in Colorado or, 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 or Utah. And they're 
great entrepreneur. It's it's usually through the network of people on the ground in the business that we know and trust mm-hmm. that have come across somebody who they know who, who they have put their eyes on and said, this is really cool. They're doing something really cool. And they tell us, hey, Chayton, hey, Sean, you guys should talk, right? Yeah, and it's I one would big say team. 90, I love that. 90% of our new investments have been that are early stage, are word of mouth connections mm-hmm. through somebody we already know and trust. Right. And the brutal reality is that if I go to a conference and somebody shows up with a five page pitch deck that I've never met before, as much as I would like to say I'm 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 I am all years and I am all years, the reality is it's much more effective if Caleb comes to me and says, This guy I know. He's got a great idea. I'm backing him. I'm going to give him 10, 15 grand or 50 grand of my money. Here's his five page pitch deck. Here's why you should take a look at it. That yeah. is much more likely if you just think about psychology. Yeah, it's your inside guy. You trust yeah. Caleb. You trust those exactly. guys. And because you've already made the investment in them. Right. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Are there. Other uh, cannabis hedge funds or investment groups in the space that um, take the approach differently, like maybe an online portal or any, like maybe they own a pitch competition, like you were mentioning. I think there are small ones that are like that, but they're very small and they have very little capital. I think that where where you're starting to see an, a bit of an emergence is more kind of family offices or families that have decided they want to be invested in this space, and they're willing to go directly um, to the entrepreneurs, usually because they have a connection. You know, we're invested in a, in a company called C3. They're, they, they're, 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 they're grew up in Buffalo. They know Buffalo. They've got, there's a series of wealthier com- families in Buffalo. They've backed them directly, not through a fund, but just directly because they know these entrepreneurs. So um, there is a growing group of family offices and high net worth individuals that are willing to go directly and invest in some of these companies without going through a investment vehicle like ours. But I, but I think that outside of the conferences and outside of finding some leaders in the industry to, to back you, like if, if you, if you want a license, if you are starting a company, if you're doing something great, get one of the, get immersed in the industry. Yeah. And get one of the, you know, get the Jungle Boy guys to say, these guys are doing something cool. Get some, a leader in the industry to have that halo effect extended to you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That and makes complete sense. If you don't have sense. the friends and family network already, the best way to get there is through somebody who's already got those connections in the, in, in the investment world. Okay. That's fair. And, and putting yourself in the shoes of the entrepreneur that, just got their license or they uh, acquired this or that and, and they're growing. Um, why why do they choose Navy Capital um, in comparison with the other options out there? I think at some level it's the ecosystem, right? It's because right. we can call up truly in Florida and say, have you tried, you know, have you thought about this product or you're not carrying this or you should look at this or you should talk to this person so one is just the connections two is because we've seen <clears throat> for better or worse we've seen a lot of companies succeed and we've also seen a lot of companies fail right and we can help people avoid some of the pitfalls that we've seen other people uh fall down through right and so just that experience of been in the industry, understanding, having invested in lots of different companies and seeing some succeed and some fail to be able to say to people, we've got real experience on what it takes to win. And here's what you might be doing wrong. And I think people value that. Like we, you know, are on a lot of boards and we've seen our fair share of of wins and losses. And so I think that for the entrepreneur, 
you want somebody in your corner who kind of will will tell it to you straight a little bit. Yeah. And um, looking at Crunchbase, uh, you guys have quite a bit of investments out there, and they're not all in growers or processors. You right. actually have some ancillary investments. Is that right? Yeah, we have a few. Not, I, I wouldn't say it's a uh, predominant part of, of our business model, but we have invested in weed maps. We have invested in GrowGen. Um, we have done uh, a few ancillary investments. Uh, the preponderance of what we do is plant touching. Okay. And um, would you say that that kind of fits into your overall theme of exposure into the the overall cannabis industry? Like someone needs to go to Weed Maps to make a delivery. Someone needs to yeah. go over here to buy equipment, et cetera. Right. I mean, I think it's it, everything we do in the ancillary space is, is all cannabis related. So everything we do yeah. is, is cannabis related. The reason we've prioritized plant touching over non-plant touching is because I have this view that you want to play, if you're playing to win, you, you'd you rather play in the easier sandbox. Okay. Right? So, uh, you know, if you want to be a computer programmer, you'd rather not be in the competition with the kids from MIT, right? If you want to be the best computer programmer in the world, sure, I get it, right? But at the end of the day, like, if you're just trying to make a return, don't, you know, you don't need to go compete against them. So if you look at the the the, the universe, institutional, like Blackstone or any of the, the bigger institutional capital providers in the world can't touch cannabis, but they can invest in the ancillary stuff. Ah, right? okay. So, because that's not plant touch. So, my our, our thesis has been the easier sandbox is the stuff where I, where all the regular guys, all the the normal private equity firms and venture capital firms can't invest, and anything that touches a plant they can't invest in, right? So and your so, your competition that's left do not have three hundred million. Exactly. So we're playing where there's less competition is the idea. Yeah. Are there other funds that that rival three hundred million? There are. There's you know there's Casa Verde. There is uh, Gotham Green. There's Merida Capital. There's a hand. Uh, there there's probably five or six. Okay. You know. Um, but there's, but, but, you know, in any other industry, like if I were to go, you know, I, I bet you there's more, there's more capital in the almond butter, be, no. yeah, or, or the <laughs> alternate beverage space in the food yeah. stream space, than, yeah, you know, than there as is as a whole, in right? Yeah, but it's coming, right? Yeah. Like that is in our future. It will be opened up. Um, and we've primarily been talking about uh, American companies, uh, a little bit of Canada, but the world's opening up um, yeah, at the same Europe, time. I mean, my partner has just spent the last week in Europe and, you know, I, I have I lived, as I mentioned at, at the beginning of the right, podcast, I, I lived in London, right? And so I know the European market very well. And when I started in cannabis, I said the likelihood that Europe will open up to legal cannabis before the United States is remote. The pace at which change happens in Europe is so slow relative to the rest of the world, right? And the U.S. Seems Just look slow at technology. <laughs> and now, if you then look fast forward a few years, you have a real possibility you're going to get federal legal. You, you will ha you have federal legalization. You will have recreational sales in Germany before you have them in the United States wow. from a national perspective, which I think is crazy. But it just goes to show how uh, how gridlocked the U.S. has become at a national level. Where like yeah. even if you have 40 states in the United States where you can have some form of legal cannabis consumption. You can have it be uh, treated as a narcotic on, on 
on par with cocaine at a national level. And it makes no sense, right? Like, it's, I think every, everybody will admit that it's nonsensical, yet you somehow have this dynamic in Washington, D.C., particularly around the Senate with two senators from every state, where, like, you just can't get anything done. Right. And it was fun. In some ways, it was by design in terms of how the, you know, now we're going veering into kind of politics and, and, and the design of the U.S. democracy. But in some ways, it was by design that the founders wanted gridlock. They wanted it to be incredibly difficult to make any kind of large change. But it is in situations like this, extremely frustrating. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and going back to, uh, you know, entrepreneurs seeking investment. Um, where would you say, or how would you, uh, let me reword this. Um, how do you envision your investment thesis changing over the next five years um, compared to the last five years? Um, are you thinking more and more into um, those edible brands? Like we were talking about Can, for example, or are you looking at more just really awesome regional brands? Um, yeah. where do you see your investment thesis changing and, and how can people, um, yeah, conform I think to that? we're starting to, I think there's a couple themes. One is that, uh, it, it's becoming increasingly, uh, clear that you're, that the likelihood that you're going to get national federal legalization and one national market with no borders is many, many years away, okay? And so we're starting to say, okay, this business is going to evolve. It's very unlikely that you're going to have one national market with no kind of individual state regulation anytime in the near future. So let's take that out of the investment thesis for the next five or 10 years. And that that has some consequences, okay? In terms of where you invest your money. That's one theme we think cross-border and national legalization is off the table for a it's very long out. time, okay? Number two is that, what does that mean? Is that you, the business continues to be very state-specific. And in that context, the most successful businesses are the ones that are vertically integrated, especially in the Midwest and on the East Coast. So we're really focusing on businesses that are vertically integrated. We've got the retail, You've got the, the wholesale, you've got the production, you can do everything soup to nuts, you control the entire margin structure. Okay. And then on the West Coast, where we're very focused on where the brands are emerging, where the brands are emerging are in edibles and high end flour, and maybe to some extent in pre roll. Right. And so we're very focused on like okay, where are we seeing real brand equity being developed on the West Coast? Those are the brands you want to be involved with. The connected the alien labs. Collected alien labs. Some of the edibles guys you talked about, Cheater on the pre roll side. Like, Jeter's you know, you're starting to see, or Stizzy, right? Who's really doing it. Yeah, they're doing a phenomenal job, right? Of, of really building up a brand, right? In California. And so, um, those so I would call West Coast brands. Okay. And on the in the Midwest and on the East Coast, vertically integrated operators that are really tight across that whole spectrum, as opposed to really good at re retail. Because you know, I, we've just started to to really appreciate that you got to be vertically integrated, be able to control yeah. that whole spectrum. And so, if you could be a great wholesale sailor, but if but if you and you might have great products in the state of Illinois, but if you don't have any retail shelves to put those products on, you've got a real problem, right? So you got to have the shelf too. Is it how the laws are structured, the uh, kind of tenure of the market? Like, what are the forces driving your different investment thesis versus West Coast brands and East Coast infrastructure? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, like, if you think about a you know a, a state that says. You're going to have 800 stores. Let, let's say Illinois had 800 stores. Okay. Or let's say Illinois had 1,000, 800 to 1,000 stores. You know, owning the store is not that important. Unless you have 400 of them, having 10 stores, neither here nor there, what do you want to do? You want to be the person that has the best flower and the lowest cost derivatives 
to, and all the stores are going to want your product because you they then they can compete with the other stores, right? They're going to have the best stuff on their shelves. Okay. Now turn it around and say there's only 100 stores instead of one more. Well, it doesn't matter. You can have the best flyer. You can have the best uh, lowest cost product. But if how do you get into those 100 stores? Like if those 100 stores, a lot of their owners also have a cultivation facility and they also have um, – products that they make themselves then it just becomes about selling their own stuff or maybe their buddy stuff so they'll say well you know look i make uh i make 10 nugs i'm I'll just use a random I, I make 10 fake carts a month i can sell three through my store i gotta sell the other seven say okay well nick you've got a store how about you sell my seven? Well, Nick, you'll say, well, I, okay, I, I have an extra four. Why don't so you, you have sell these, mine? So you yeah. little trade. You know, like, I'll sell yours, you sell mine. And yeah. that's how you get on the shelf. And so you've got Sean You've been seeing there. that a lot? Like, that's pretty yeah, common? Yeah, Sean over there might have the best brand from California, and he might have the lowest cost production. He'll come to, to you, Nick, and he'll say, hey, sell my vape cart. He'll say, no, I'm selling my own, and I'm selling cheap. So you say, well, I would just sell Chaitin's. I've got a better one than Chaitin's. He's like, yeah, mm. but Chaitin sells mine. Yeah. Right? Now we're doing we, – because there's not enough stores. So now all of a sudden you got to uh, – but if there was 800 stores, then Sean would come in, and we would both want to carry his stuff because I would be – I would say, well, I don't want the customers going to Nick's, yeah. right? <laughs> and so you – and because if, if, you, if you've got Sean's pens and I don't, they're going to go to your store, right? So – the regulatory structure in every state, it, it dictates where the profit margin sits in yeah. that state, right? But the best way to protect yourself over a medium term is to be fully vertically integrated. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And, um, you know, there's a lot of argument over the years of multi-state operators, MSOs, um, not achieving the same quality of products, like predominantly flour, right. in comparison to like a, a single grow operation um, that's more craft or, you know, not even boutique, right. but just a little bit more craft. Um, what do you have to say and, you know, kind of about that argument? Um, well, first about of all, I think that this whole idea that multi state operators scale really matters is being proven to be like scale matters at a very local level. Okay. But like having like, a little operation in 40 states who cares like there hasn't been any synergy between all those 40 states right like and so one of the things that i think has happened with msos is they've grown very quickly and they've grown through acquisitions right and uh, so they've got like this facility here and that facility there extra and baggage and dirty laundry from other not just that like you've got inconsistent grow operations and growing is hard you can talk to any grower Growing good flowers hard, right? It's a it's a difficult plant to grow, and if you're and 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 it's a difficult business to operate. The regulatory hurdles, the lack of capital, the two eighty e, the talent. So many of the MSOs have grown so quickly through so many acquisitions that they've got real heavy lifts in every state. And the problem is if you Put, if you take your eye off the ball in any particular state, you're gonna you're gonna get crushed, right? And so I think that's part of the issue. The part of the issue is that it's it's a very operationally intensive business where it's hard to do it across multiple geographies in a consistent and excellent way in every one of those geographies. And so people have grown too quickly and they've lost control of their their their. Uh, their ability now yeah the other thing is that the mso's have wanted to create national companies right with national brands and with and the way you create a national company with a national brand is you make it all look the same right you basically Uniformity. have a pretty, you, know, you have a particular store layout every apple store looks the same every total wine store kind of looks the same you've got uniform products you have consistency of products across various states if you look and so the most natural way for the for the mso to do that 
is through derivatives, right? Like your vape pen can sort of be the same everywhere if you're using it to store it. Very hard to do that with flour, right? Because like different growing conditions, different. Yeah. All right. So they've kind of focused a lot on derivatives with thought process that it, that, that would dominate the market. Well, the reality is flour is still 50% of the market and it drives a lot of the consumer decision as to which store to go to. And this idea that like every store should look the same is a tech, like, you know, the, the cure leaf store that looks one way in New Jersey isn't going to work in, in Nevada where the tourist is all going to, to planet 13 and it's just the local and the local doesn't want the store that looks like an Apple store, right? He wants like a store that looks like a weed shop. And so you have the, if you have the store that looks the same in those two different geographies, it, it works in one and not in the other. So, um, the MSOs, I think, are very focused on uniformity. They've been very focused on derivative, and they've and 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 it's been and they've learned that there's really not a lot of synergies between states. Every state is its own business, and so it needs its own team, it needs its own focus, it needs its own strategy. And that strategy in one state might be very different from the strategy in another state. The stores, the emphasis on quality, the emphasis on on how you grow. Everything can be totally different between one state and the next, and their ability to manage that when they've grown so quickly with so many acquisitions has been very, very challenging. Yeah, but very you challenging. you uh, believe that over the next five to ten years, that's going to start stabilizing, and yeah. like everyone's once they start following the right SOPs that are consistent across state to state operations. Um, that there's there's going to be that consistent product yeah. and, and the You're quality can start to, to yeah. You're starting to see it, right? You're starting to see it. People have realized that like the mega grows are hard to manage, right? So maybe dial the grows down. Like, yeah. you know, I'm not going to name names, but we went to a, what was considered a state-of-the-art grow and you had the, the, uh, the veg across the street, uh, across the way from the drying room. So of course all of the fungus from the drying room is getting into the your mother's, right? Like and then like but you would never put them that way. But so now, now of course they've now figured this out. Or one of these huge state of the art grows had a train that went through the entire grow. So of course if you got fungal, you know, any kind of issue in, in one area, you're now just transporting it on the train across the entirety of the grow. Like little things like that that like weren't in the manual when they built the facility you're starting to say okay well geez we maybe we did this wrong we need to retrofit we need to fix right. etc so it's just a, it's it's just a matter of an industry that grew incredibly quickly through a yeah. series of acquisitions um where now there's a lot of digestion going on yeah. and recalibration and and I think in that process, some people will succeed and some people will fail. Some people will adjust and thrive and some won't make it. Yeah. And I kind of see this interesting dichotomy right now. There's this group that I would very much put connected in Alien Labs in, uh, Stizzy, Jungle Boys, Cookies, right? Um, very, very strong brands, very strong products, um, communities that will follow them anywhere. And however much they scale overnight, it's it's supported, you know, like there's this new facility in Florida, like, let's go, you know, now right. we have access to these products over there. It's very benevolent and it's very positive. Um, but then on the other side, I see these companies that maybe are structured the same, but they don't really have that background or community and they might be vilified. Like the more growth that they have, even if it was the same exact, uh, you know, regions, it's almost like a bad thing. Uh, it's it's just an interesting dichotomy to me. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? To me, it's like it's all about like if you if you want if you want to build a brand, right? You got to build a community and get a message behind that brand, right? That's what everybody says. And I'm not a big, I'm, I'm I don't have a huge background in brand building, but I listen to what people say, right? And Casamigos or any any brand that's been built it has an identity, has a culture, has a community behind it. Right, yeah. an and ethos, a voice, an ethos. What it, like can has an ethos, has a voice, yeah, has a community. Like people know what it stands for, and uh, and it's very difficult to just brand is not just packaging. Right? It's it. There's something 
there's something more to it that people kind of have a an understanding, affiliation, a, a connection to it. And so cannabis has a real deep culture on the West Coast and, and they're brands that have a cultural roots to them, yeah. right? And so I think that other, some people have just missed the boat on that in the industry. They've just kind of- It was a timing thing, like just, old school versus new school? I think some of that's old school versus new school. I think some of that is just- uh, a little bit of like uh, arrogance, right? To sort of uh, some of it's not listening to your consumer and customer, uh, and some of that is kind of you know East Coast versus West Coast type of thing, where like a lot of the East Coast people say, you know, the West Coast brands just have no rev- reverence and relevance in our markets, and so we're not going to bring them in and. We'll just build our own brands. And then Mm. there's others that say, you know, that's just an arrogant approach. These people know what they're doing out there. They've created real brands. There's real brand equity. And when they come into your market, they're going to eat your lunch. And so, yeah, you might have a five-year head start, but it doesn't matter. When they come into your market, you're going to have a real problem. So you might as well be, you're going to, you know, you might as well collaborate with them now and get them in your tent then just yep, presume on your team that they are now we're going to come into your market because when they come into your market you're going to have a problem yeah and, and that's exactly what i'm seeing play out right now right with all all those brands we just mentioned they're all going to florida and it's kind of an interesting petri dish right now um you know with with companies like true leaf that do hold um you know a yeah. lot of market share so i think uh, to be determined, it's really interesting to see that. Yeah, and just kind of successful connectors been in Arizona. I mean. Yeah, crushing it. I filmed them literally. I think it was the week they opened, or we, we were filming their grow the week after they launched in Arizona. Lines out the door. Um, yeah. I think it was through your Harvest Retail Network at the time. It was a couple years ago. Right. Um, but that's exactly right. Like in talking with Caleb and in talking with Ted in that episode. Um, even though, even though they were a California brand, they had fans in Arizona. Um, and there's a ton of fans on the East coast of West coast brands. And, um, it's just kind of interesting. Like I haven't, I haven't seen a whole lot of East coast brands make the jump into the West coast market. It's typically the other way around. 100%. 100%. Yeah. The re- Look, and then the one thing we haven't talked about on this, on this podcast so far that I think is a real kind of determinant of success for investment in cannabis going forward is what's going to happen to the illicit market. Yes. Right. What's going to happen to the illicit market? Because their willingness, you know, we've got a very interesting scenario right now in America, which is we don't want to legalize weed at a national level. But at a local level, we have no desire to prosecute anybody for weed. Right. Which is a really interesting dynamic because then you have New York City. The left and right aren't talking. You you know, you have New York where you don't have legalized weed yet, but you can walk down any street in, in New York City and you can buy whatever you want. Every West Coast yeah. brand is for sale on the street, totally unregulated. The police does nothing. Really? The, there's there's no enforcement because the willingness, the political will to put anybody in jail for selling weed is zero in New yeah. York. Right? And Nobody's consumption and yeah. So you have, you know, that would never happen in alcohol. You know, right. if you were trying to sell bootleg alcohol, you'd be in jail real fast. Yep. You know, or trying to trying to, trying yeah, to yeah. like brew your own. You know how yeah, many you're trying lists to sell bootleg cigarettes in America, you got a real problem. Yeah. Right. You're gonna DA is gonna be at your front door real fast. You're trying to sell illegal weed in the United States, no problem. Wow. Anywhere, any right. And so the consumer uh now has to just choose between going to a legal dispenser in a state where it's legal, going to a legal dispenser or buying for their dealer when there's often a huge disparity in cost between the two avenues. And I think that how successful this industry ultimately is 
is going to depend in some measure on how regulators navigate that conflict. Yeah. And, and how much of the illicit market, let's just take California, for example, um, how much is leaving the state? How much was yeah. leaving the state? And now that these other markets are legalizing and opening up, um, it, like, how do we it's quantify that? Now, it's right? trapped. And, so and prices you, are have, dropping, oversupply, yeah. because you can't, you know, send it over to Utah anymore, right? Yeah. Um, and you have huge illicit grows in places like Michigan and Oklahoma. Yeah. That And and and, and so um, there's a real question, like, for the industry to be successful, you need the industry to get legalized at a, both a, a local like a federal, level oh, local. and at the federal level. But like you need the local, just take California, for example. Yeah, California uh, consumption, if you look at the legal market divided by the population of California, is one of the lowest in the country. Colorado is 3x. California. Now, there's no way that Colorado residents consume, on average, 3x the amount of cannabis that California residents do, right? Like, we all anecdotally know that California is a high-consumption state for cannabis. But what is the, the dichotomy is all regulatory, right? Because you have an illicit market that's enormous in California. Yeah? And it's totally unchecked and unregulated. And the price disparity between the legal market and the illicit market is enormous because the legal market is overregulated, overtaxed, and there's zero enforcement on the illicit market. And so these guys basically operate at this price point, and these guys operate at this price point. And then you tell the consumer, you can buy from wherever you want. We don't care. There's no consequences, right? That, that ultimately, for the business to be successful, that gap needs to close, right? Yeah. Like we may need to make their life a little harder so their cost goes up here and their life a little easier so their cost goes down here. Now we all know it's never gonna be like this or it's not gonna be like this for a very long time because you're starting here, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But just narrowing that gap so the consumer says, well, you know, I can go to the legal dispensary and, blah, and it's gonna be a lot cheaper. Now, you're going back to your nug example. Mm -hmm. In edibles, the likelihood the consumer says, I go to the dispensary and buy the Kiva is a lot higher because he knows that if he buys that baggie with a bunch of apples and the TNC is it, he's going to have I've, I've been there. Experience. I've been there so, hey, in the movie whereas, theater. It's not good. Yeah, it's a bad experience. So yeah. you, so, so in certain categories, the consumer is going to gravitate to the legal market a little bit, but in fake, in flower, you got to narrow that gap, right? And, and, and how successful this industry is ultimately will depend on what the regulators do to narrow that gap. Yeah. And are you seeing any communication? As I'm, I'm sure you guys have some analysis of federal and, and some of the state um, markets that you're investing in. Are you seeing any communication um, uh, across you know, no, um, no, not, not across states. But what I am starting to see is some acknowledgement, at least, you know, Gavin Newsom finally acknowledged that we need to do something to help the the, the regulated market. They're eliminating, I think, in, the, in his budget, he eliminated the cultivation tax, which has been a huge burden on yeah. legal operators. I think that the most recent version that came out of the legislature continues to exclude the cultivation tax. So that'll be a lot of relief for the legal operators. Um, we're starting to see more pressure on municipalities to uh, to open up to dispensaries in California because you still have 70% of the municipalities in California don't allow legal dispensaries, which is crazy, but it's true. Um, so you're starting to see at a state and micro level more pressure to open up and to make it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you, hear, you read about all these these operators where they went into the grow and they destroyed a million dollars worth of product and those but that's still the exception rather than the rule right they're not going up into humble to destroy it and and, and one way and in one really way out yeah they, <laughs> they're not disrupting that that yeah. industry right same thing in washington state same thing in oregon like 
there's still a very, very large illicit grow problem in America. And the regulators are making a nod towards it, but it's it's early it's yeah. early days to really crack down. Well, what would you do, you know, like if you were in the position of uh let's say you've been growing to support your family and, and your life for your entire, you know, life and, and working career, um illicitly. Um, and then the state says, Hey, let's go legal and you know, uh you gotta jump over here, but we're gonna tax you, you know, seven seven ways to Sunday, um, and you're not gonna make any money. It's just like, well, why? Yeah, so this is like, a dilemma, right? At a at a at a micro level, there's it makes no sense to put a person in jail for growing a plant, right? At a micro level. Like, it makes no sense to take that person and say you're going to jail for that. Right. Right. Or we're gonna destroy your life with it. At a, and that's at and that's this is part this is a dilemma not just in cannabis but in everything in life, which is that you can make a macro policy, but then when you apply that macro policy, you're always gonna find specific examples of individuals where it's terribly unfair or unethical to that in the particular individual and that that policy is being enacted so how do you reconcile the two right we should get rid of coal plants so what happens to all the coal miners don't have any other skill well you know we should build a cement plant well what happens to the village across the street from the smell cement plant it's like we should, trying to fix symptoms right. how do you you make macro policy but then there's always a micro impact of macro policy and so how do you reconcile the rights of individual and, and, and the hu- the human cost to individuals of a policy that benefits the whole. And this is not a cannabis issue. This is an issue in everything, right? Mm. So when you're making environmental policy, when you're making policy with respect to irrigation and water rights, there's always this kind of cut, like who bears the burden some is often one a group of individuals potentially for the benefit of a big society and then how do you reconcile those interests right how do you bring those people into the conversation etc right every mine that gets built there's usually a community that lives on top of that mine or across the street how do you deal with that and so cannabis i view is a very sim- same problem okay do i think that all these people should go to jail no do we, does it make sense to take away their livelihood? No. Is it terribly unfair? Yes. Is there? Do we need to find ways to bring them into the legal market? Yes, because if we don't, there'll never be a real legal market. Right. And so the macro policy is obvious. We need to legalize, and we need to get rid of the illicit market. That macro policy, I think, makes a lot of sense. If you want this to be a real industry, you need to make it a legal industry. What do you do about the illicit industry? Well, it's terribly unfair to shut it down overnight. How do you transition those people? How do you do it in a humane way? Uh, there's no perfect answer. If there was a perfect answer, we would have done it. Right? Yeah. And, and there's going to be breakage costs. There's going to be that person who's been growing illicitly and feeding their family who all of a sudden loses their livelihood uh, because their farm gets shut down. And if you and and if they transition to the legal market, they can't compete. They can't and, compete, and they can't you know? have a livelihood. They can't support their livelihood that way either. They can't because that that little farm, when you tax it and at the same rates as the legal market, they can't compete with the yeah, guy the down the street scale. who's got ten thousand acres, right, and not ten acres. Yeah, and so he the, the, that person's out of business. How do you, what do you do about that? Right. And uh, there's not a great answer, like, unfortunately. Uh, But I think that if you don't do that, you'll never have a real legal industry. Not not because the legal industry will eventually just churn itself out. You will never be able to compete. Yeah. And you mentioned um, over the next 10 years, like having cross state uh partnerships and agreements and federal legalization it's it's just you don't think it's going to happen 
I think federal legalization will happen. Federally, you do. I think federal legalization will happen. But I think it'll be very incremental. I think it'll take a very long time. Let's start and with I expungement think, and things that are yes. in that theme. And even can, when federal legalization happens, I think it'll happen in a way which says every state can decide for themselves whether they want to. So Alabama can say, we're not going to have recreational, but we'll have medicinal, right? It'll say it's not, it's no longer a federal crime, but it doesn't mean that it can't be, but the states can't decide what they're going to do state by state. Okay. Right. And I, th- and man, and by the way, that's how alcohol is regulated, right? Like you still have, uh, Blue laws in New Jersey. Like, there's lots of places you can't sell alcohol on Sundays. Ah, right. Yeah. Like, and in the Lynchburg, Bible Belt, Tennessee, and Lynchburg, Tennessee is a dry county. Every ounce of Jack Daniels in America is made in Lynchburg, Tennessee, but it's a dry county. You can't buy it. <laughs> right. So it's a <laughs> that's a weird one. That's yeah. a weird one. It's 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 a hyper local regulation, and so I think that cannabis will be the same. They'll say, Alabama, you do what you want. Tennessee, you do what you want. Florida, you do what you want. Everybody will do something different. And most states will not want product from other states coming into their state because they'll say, we want to test it. We want to regulate it. We want to control mm. the licenses. We want to be able to say, we want to tax it. And so the minute, like, the state of uh, Connecticut says, Bring it in from wherever you want, and you can sell it wherever you want. All of their cultivation facilities in the state of Connecticut, go, will, will, most of them will go out of business because they can't compete with the cultivation, with all the product that's going to be coming in from out of state. And so what happens to the tax revenue? Well, yeah, why is that good for the state of Connecticut? So my, my let, what, what I, do I think that eventually we'll have one national market? Yes. Do I think it's going to take a very long time? Most likely. Yeah. Most likely. That's not to say that we won't have federal legalization. It's that I think that the, and and again, we're talking about likelihoods. The most likely way we get federal legalization is for the federal government to say it's no longer a Schedule One drug. It's now up to the states to decide for themselves how they want to regulate it. And I believe that most states will regulate it in such a way that it makes it cumbersome to bring product across state lines. Let's talk a little more about Horticultural Lighting Group. I already told you about their high quality lamps and stellar customer service, but hey, don't take my word for it. Check out some of these testimonials from real growers just like you. Best canopy I've grown yet. The customer service is excellent. The customer service is second to none. I love these lights. Amazing lights and amazing people. Horticultural Lighting Group provides real efficiency and real yields. So, whether you're looking for a lighting solution for a commercial operation or a small home grow, do yourself a favor and check out Horticulture Lighting Group at hlg.com, and I'll also include a link in the description below. Um, But diving back into it, uh, you know, imagine someone's listening to this and they're, they're asking the question, well... I want to get into cannabis. I want to start a business. I want to um, maybe even invest in a business, but I want to start something new. And you have all these different options. You know, you can go to an entry level state like Oklahoma that doesn't have a a whole lot of barriers to entry. Um, You can go to more fixed states, um, but uh, they they're kind of curious. Like, should they be a grow operation? Should they be a processor like a can? Um, Should they just be a retail um, or should they be on the ancillary side, right? So I'm curious, um, kind of with the lens of what do you think is the most profitable if they were able to get into that? And then maybe um, what would you say is the most uh, novice friendly, someone that doesn't have 20 years of cultivation experience, but can easily pick up over here? Look, the easiest thing to get into is to win a license and open a retail store. In right. which state? In any of these East Coast or Midwest states where there's limited okay. licenses and there's lotteries uh, okay. to get those licenses. Anything else where you're getting into production or cultivation, you just need a ton of capital. And if you don't have the experience, you're never going to raise the capital. So I okay. think those are really, really hard rows 
roads to go down. And then if you want to do something that's like a brand or wh whatever, I think it's really like you want to go into a competitive state and have something really novel, you know, uh, you do fruit juice with the like, what do you call those like juicy fruit where like you have gushers? The, the lick, yeah, gusher. Yeah, gushers. you got something different. Yeah, right? like uh, you got something. I've you never know. had a medicated gusher. That sounds pretty bomb. Right, like yeah. you're doing something that's different. You're doing luxury chocolate, like you know what? And I'm not saying these are good ideas. I'm just saying right. it's differentiated, right? Uh, something uh, unique. Something unique. Then you want to go to the West one. Coast where it's a big developed market where you know you're you're you 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 have a big enough end customer base to sell into so that even if you have a very small percent of the market share you can get it that's what i would like if i were coming up with a new product or, or a product innovation i'd go west coast if you're going to go east coast and you have a lot of money then you do cult cultivation or production. If you don't have a lot of money and a lot, you don't have a lot of experience, you got to go retail. And and what's a lot of money? You know, if, if someone really does want to go, because the people yeah. that are in our comments, um, majority of the time, like they're growers, right? So they right. really want to, you know, uh, start a grow operation. So to give them kind of a realistic expectation, I uh, think if you don't burn have, rate and how yeah. much they need in the, the tank. I think if you want to be a grower on the East Coast, you're gonna, first of all, you're you're pretty much almost certainly going to be growing indoors. Yeah, right. Which is more expensive. And, and you're you're. I think you need millions of dollars. Ten million, yeah. twenty million, thirty million. Well, you know, no, you. I mean, you're going to get debt financing for some of it, right? Uh huh. And so there is debt financing, but you need at least two, three, four million dollars of just walking around money that you're willing to lose. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so predominantly equity, yeah. friends, families, right? Yes, friends and families. Sometimes people right. say fools, but like right. the three and Fs. You got to go in the license, so you got to spend a lot of money winning a license that you may not win. So you got to go to right. the law firm, put in the license application. You got to figure out how to get that license. Out, you know, because there's people who are good at winning licenses, and so these licenses are hard to win. You got to win one of those licenses because if you're going to buy a license, that's very expensive. Yeah, right. and it's you not necessarily a lottery ticket, right? Like you still got to put in the work. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And there's different it used stipulations. To be the case that if you want a license, you could turn around and flip it, but it's much harder to do. Much harder. Yeah, like the the naked licenses are worth a lot. Less. Right. So yeah. I think that if you're a grower and you really know how to grow, the best way to leverage that is to go partner with somebody who doesn't know, who has the license but doesn't know how to grow. Okay. Um, and you would be like in this instance, um, the grow department or the cultivation team sure. at that facility. Correct. Right. Yeah. There are a lot of people who say like, I just want, I have this license in New Jersey or New York, but I don't really have real expertise in growing. Why don't I give 20% of the economics to connect it or whomever and let them run the grow operation? Yeah, that makes sense. And um, there's also a lot of breeders out there. Um, there I've seen a ton of deals where you could be the best at what you do at breeding, but you're not growing production at scale, right? But you are bringing new uh, cultivars or new genetics um, to the market. Right. And there's licensing deals out there. Um, yeah, there there that are the states MSOs that can license are starting it. to recognize that they need to have good genetics, right? Yeah. I think for the long time, the MSOs got drunk on their limited licenses. They got drunk on very high prices and they got drunk on this idea that the runway was very long. What do I mean by that? If you're selling crap weed for $4,000 with, with no strain selection and there, and you think, well, this is, you know, and then that's what's model, built this reputation we were talking about earlier. Yeah, and then in your model, the price goes down 5% a year and you've got a captive audience. Why do you care, right? You're just printing money. But what happens if the price all of a sudden goes, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 for, and all of a sudden with better competition, with better genetics, right? Like look at, look at Massachusetts, the price has collapsed, but for good, high quality flour, you can still get paid 2,500 or $3,000 a pound. 
but only for really good high quality flour, which is in low supply, Mm -hmm. right? For generic, cheap flour, the prices collapse from $3,000 a pound to $1,000 a pound. So if you've got really unique genetics, if you've got the ability to grow really high quality flour, and you go to somebody in Massachusetts and say, hey, geez, you've been selling for $3,000 a pound MSO in Massachusetts, and now the price has collapsed to $1,000 a pound for what you grow. But if you buy my genetics or you license my genetics, you might be able to sell some portion of your flour for a much higher price point. That becomes a compelling proposition. If I'm selling crap to $4,000 a pound, I don't need to give any of the economics away to you for uh, giving me your high-end genetics. It's like, why would I Why would I do that? I'm just sharing my profit pool with you. Right. And, and are we reaching I, that tipping point right now, like sure. across that's the states? Why, that's why Connected is getting into Arizona, into Florida, into, and by invitation, right? Wow. By people saying, why don't you come They're into my fire. state? Yeah. Because all of a sudden, quality matters, and it becomes a real differentiator. Yeah. And, you know, we, we didn't really dive into Connected. Um, so what what did that deal look like? You know, it came to you maybe by Caleb or a friend of a friend. Yeah. Um, what were they really looking to do by bringing on a partner like you? Um, and, and how is it going? Sure. It's going. Look, I think that um, – this investment was made several years ago and now so even at that point the idea that you could have brands and flyer was at at that point there were two things one was people didn't really believe you could have brands and And number two people thought that flyer was a dying category that over time all the the what they call cannabis 2.0 consumers the cannabis consumers we're going to gravitate to derivative products, whether it's vapes, edibles, tinctures, and that the pie, the flower pie, would continue to shrink and shrink, right? And our view was that at least at the high end, there was a place for a kind of luxury, high-end flower producer, and that that niche was a little bit bigger than people thought. So you had connected that grew up basically selling through their two or three stores in, in, in uh, Northern California, in Sacramento. Yeah. And they were looking to grow that business to a statewide wholesale business, right? Northern California, Southern California, Central California. And we provided them the capital early on to, to take that business from a niche Northern California business to a statewide business. Okay. Now, Several years later, I think that they have proven out that there is a place for high-end flower, that the category is a real category, that the customer cares about that category, and that the customer will pay for that category. And they are in the process of proving out that their brand matters in that category, right? And uh, that's not a done deal by any stretch of the imagination in terms of uh, a, a proof point, but I think it is uh, on its way to uh it, it, it's on its way uh, and i think that we love the company we love what they're doing we think that california remains an incredibly tough market for all the reasons that we've talked about during this podcast and so it's certainly not easy right yeah um because it is still overcapitalized relative to the market size that exists in california however um we love the fact that their brand is getting attention in all these other states where they're where they're essentially being invited in to grow their brand into other states. And so now, if we can be in um, uh, Florida, if we can be in Arizona, if we can maybe get into New York and Illinois, we can be in the largest markets in the U.S. So that when the barriers come down over time, this can be a real national brand. Uh, and like I said earlier in the podcast like it's not clear how brands are going to emerge in this space but to the extent that they are going to emerge and you're going to have true national brands connected is in the running to be one of those true national brands. absolutely yeah everyone talks about who who's going to be the first coca-cola of weed right you know who's going to be the pepsi who, who are these staples 
Um, right. We can't have a thousand. I mean, I just, I don't see it. Right. Um, I, I do see these brands emerging as like the best of the right. best. And uh, I mean, right. you're, and in your opinion, is it uh-huh. going to be like Steezy and Vape and maybe Connected yeah. and Flower? Like how, you know, we don't yeah. know. Like this. These category leaders. I mean, right. you know, Steezy could do everything, but that blue burst vape cart is their, right. that's like their number one skew and they right. might dominate the cart game. I see that already in, in California. Um, in your opinion, do you see Connected and Alien Labs and, and some of these other brands, do you see them global? Do you see, like, you go to Bogota, Colombia, and you can smoke that same, you know, Blue Burst cart as it is in California, as it is in Germany? Like, is that the I end game? I think it's harder to do it flower than it is to do it vape, right? Uh, and the reason for that is that, like, are you, are you, it really depends on how the laws emerge, right? If, if it means that, like, I need to go build an indoor facility in Bogota and then manage that facility and produce the same quality of flour in Bogota that I produce in California, that's a slow, slow, slow process. It'll take many, many, many years, right? If, on the other hand, I could put it on an airplane or on a boat and ship it there. And it has then shelf it, life. Then it, then, it gets much, then it gets much easier. So, like, again, using the 50-state example in the United States, if I need to build a cultivation facility in each one of the 50 states to be a national brand, that's a long process. Very expensive too. Right, very expensive and very long. And very risky because like the day I can go cross border, 44, 44 in my facilities might not be worth much, right? And yeah. I, but I've spent tens of millions of dollars to build them all. So there's a real risk. So the global brand, the the, the ability to develop a global brand to, to, is is going to be different by category and it's going to be determined a lot by the ability to move product cross border. Now, Kiba chocolate, much easier to do. Yeah. Because you don't have to build a whole plant. You just need to buy distal. Which right. again, going back to the tool processor example, right. like it's there's so many out there. Right. It's a lot easier to go You're to building Bogota your, and buy some distillate yeah. and then sell it there. To go to Guadalajara by just let sell it there. Yeah. To go. So now all of a sudden you need a coal packer, you need a chocolate yeah. manufacturer. That's that's a lot easier to develop that infrastructure than it is for high end flour. Interesting. So the ability to build a global brand in a in a edible, a distillate based edible is going to be a lot easier. Okay. But then conversely, for can is very difficult because bottling is very expensive and distribution of bottling is very expensive. So you lose a ton of money from it, right? Like think about the cost of going into a new state for, for like let's say I wanted to go to Oregon for camp. I gotta go get a bottle. I gotta go get somebody to do the kit to, to I can't take my cans for, that are being manufactured in California and ship them to Oregon. Right. I need to basically recreate the whole supply chain in Oregon, right? But not only do I need to go get somebody to uh, make the cans in Oregon, uh, the, uh, then then they have to they have to fill them in, in with the right technology, and then they have to distribute them to all the dispensaries in Oregon. And distri- distributing liquid is expensive. Yeah, right. Distributing Punctured liquid cans is, and yeah, it's just heavy, right? They're heavy. Like you need to get it on a truck. That's why, like, in Coca-Cola, the bottling companies make a lot of money because distribution is lucrative and you need scale to do it. And so you burn a lot of money until you get to scale. So, like, taking Kiva National, much easier than taking Can National, much cheaper than taking Can National. So I think it's, like, if I think about national or global brands, a lot of it is going to depend on the category. Yeah. That makes complete sense. And um, just, you know, yeah, I- I'm just tying this all together here. Um, let me see here. All right. So I have my, my wrap here. So we're going to kind of go on the last question here. Huh? So in your you know tenure at Navy Capital, um, what are some of the most innovative products or maybe new category leaders um, that are out there today in the cannabis industry? Yeah, so look, I think that some of the things that we've t- touched on are really interesting to think about. Like, I think that this idea of beverage is really interesting. Like, 
can beverage can, can cannabis beverages really start to eat into beer wine and liquor i think they can but i don't think they really can until you can buy them in a bar so subliminal right. message there right so exactly like so to me that's a really emergent category emergent category is is beverage and how and and because yeah. i think that cannabis beverage can take huge amounts of market share from uh wine and spirits and maybe to some extent beer but particularly wine and spirits and seltzer right cannabis seltzer, uh, mm-hmm. uh, from the the hard seltzer category right but you got to be able to have the social experience yeah but to me that's a very emergent category one to really keep an eye on and it's a new yeah. demographic of consumers uh like right. the cali sober consumer that right. Maybe they want to go to a bar. They want to hang out right. with the friends on on the Friday night, but they don't want to drink seven beers. They don't want right. to drink a whole bottle of wine. But do you have can on the menu? You know exactly, exactly. But but as long as it's limited to the house party, it's like not a, it doesn't catch on as much as when you exactly. went to the bar. You had it. You had a few. You loved it. Now you're gonna have it on a Tuesday night also, right? Yeah, yeah and you like, can pick it up at your local dispensary. Casamigos at home. Yeah. Everybody goes out. And has a couple of margaritas, and then on the and then buys a Casamigos, and then has one on a Tuesday or on a Wednesday night. Yeah, right? like, yeah, they're good. That's to how market. I got into tequila. I started drinking tequila out, and then yeah. I was like, I'm gonna have a couple bottles at home, so that every now and then I'm gonna have a tequila. Yeah. Right. So it has to start with the social experience. Can we get that into a social experience? I think so. It's an emergent category. I think that'll be awesome. Uh, other areas where we're we're seeing a lot is in the pre-roll space. You know, pre-roll historically, historically the pre-roll has been much inferior in quality to whole flour. It's been right? the hot dog market. Right. It's been the crap to get you high. <laughs> the scraps. It tastes, it tastes like crap, right? And you're starting to get higher and higher quality pre-rolls. And if you think about that that has that that is a really interesting dynamic because over time i think people would much rather a lot of people would much rather buy and smoke a, a mini than mm-hmm. sit there and cut a up dog nuts, walker and, right yeah like and roll it up etc so that's another really interesting dynamic we're seeing is the quality of pre-rolls improves taking market share from whole flour you're seeing that in california right jeter that as the quality of the pre-rolls improving they're taking share from whole flour that should continue and then the last thing that that we're seeing is vape right with vape gate with jewel you saw a real decline in vape jewel just got taken off all american off shelves. shelves that's but insane people have started to come back and say you know what uh that was a jewel specific issue Vaping cannabis makes sense. It's it's not vaping as a technology that's flawed. It was the vaping the nicotine, nicotine and the right? age the age that they're kind of permeating. And so it, so and it's a and if I'm going to be out and about, I'd rather probably vape than roll a joint, right? Yeah. And so uh, we're seeing a lot in that we're seeing vape really come back and take market share back. And I think those trends are all going to continue. Yeah. Anything on the ancillary side that you've seen? I think more, more, more so just, um, you know, more and more software, more and more tr- tracking and tracing technology. Um, all the ancillary businesses are growing up really nicely to facilitate everything from like point of sale software at the stores. Uh, all of that's improving, right? And the real question is over time, will it improve to the point where it becomes so embedded in the industry that the big guys, when they come into the industry, like a salesforce.com, they're not just, they're going to have to buy the CRM software for the industry, as opposed yeah. to just producing a version for the industry that's already better than what the industry has, right? Same thing. For, so there's a lot of like investment dollar going into the ancillary space to develop the technologies that the industry needs to to move forward and then there's also like 
a lot of advances that are happening in soil in lighting in just what I would call the ag tech side of this business that are really exciting. You know, just the yields, the, the quality of the bud, the methods by which people are growing. I think if Speed. you think about the, 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 the innovation curve in cannabis over the last hundred years, right? In terms, it's probably been like growers have like learned and learned and learned. And over time, there's been improvements and improvements. And now you're sort of in this inflection mm -hmm. point where you're starting to see massive improvements, whether it's vertical farming, but what all these like ag tech meets cannabis is happening. Right. And the and access so, to knowledge of how and what to use. Um, yeah. That's like the the sole focus of Canna Cribs and Deep Roots and everything we do, right, is to yeah. educate and empower. And if you see what the Jungle Boys are rocking and you're about to build out a facility or, you know, purchase your right. next phase of expansion, you're, you probably want to grow like them or, right. or the Stizzy episode, et cetera. So I think right. access beyond just, I mean, once upon a time we had the marijuana like grow Bible. And that right. was that was revolutionary, right? And I think every year, as of recently, the past five years, our content, our community, like those things are just scaling right. like crazy. Right. And so I think those are all really exciting developments, you know, for, for our industry. Uh, and, I, and I expect that to continue. I expect that ag tech and cannabis to continue to meet and the quality to continue. To yeah. Well, Chayton, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me on. Yeah, it's been an yeah. absolute pleasure. Absolutely. And uh, I'm looking forward to filming some of your facilities out in Florida and, and other states as they uh, join the Navy Capital Group. It's been a pleasure and uh, best of luck to you. And uh, I'm sure our paths will cross soon. Hey, thanks for tuning in today on the Canna Cribs podcast. Brought to you by the top brands in the game. We have six categories you want to highlight to help you elevate your craft. Starting off with Cultivation by Grodan, Lighting by Horticulture Lighting Group, Nutrients by Athena, Climate Control by Quest, Post Harvest by Green Bros, and Dispensary by Trees. Thank you to these partners for helping us create this podcast and helping us bring more knowledge to your garden. If you want to support the Can of Cribs podcast, Head on over to the link in the description or go to growershouse.com and check out these industry leaders today. And while you're there, hit us up on Instagram. Hit us up on the Growers Network Forum. We have thousands of growers all around the world on both our Instagram and our forum, just like you, looking to elevate their craft. Happy growing.